So welcome to Cheese in Depth. I'm Michael Landis and uh, today I have the pleasure of being able to sit down with some of the uh, icons of the cheese industry and uh, some of the best people in the world that I've ever met. Uh, we're going to have a chat with Peggy Smith, with Allison Hooper, and Mary Keene. So, uh, you know, this is kind of an open forum for them. My biggest question to start off with is, uh, what in the world made you want to get into cheese so many years ago, and uh, nobody else was doing anything? So, uh, whoever wants to start first, go ahead. <laughs> go, Allison. Okay, I'll go. Okay. Um, well, a lot of other people were doing a lot of other things, but they weren't making cheese. Um, you know, when you're in your 20s, you think you can do anything. And so, uh, went to France um, during college, got a job on a farm in the summer making cheese, and I just absolutely loved it and loved living that lifestyle of making food and making something and so i just thought wow americans really need this this good stuff that we eat in france and so wandered up to vermont and got it going a few years later but gosh that was in 19 i was 19 years old and that was in 1980 so yeah i just well, love doing it I moved from uh, Sonoma County up to, we bought 80 acres, uh, built a log cabin uh, with logs we drug out of the woods with a horse. And it was the back to the land era. And it was the seven, 71, I think. And so I caught a couple of wild goats and took them up there. And so, you know, if you have two goats, pretty soon you've got 20. and you know, it was the right thing to do for me at the time was just make cheese at home. And then my friend opened a restaurant and she said, oh, cool, I'll buy your cheese. And I thought, oh, cool, I can do that. I had no training in France, unfortunately. So I just winged it. It's ready, fire, aim is my motto. <laughs> and I was a, a late comer to the game. I was... Um, cooking for a long time out of out of college and um, I didn't start making cheese until 1997 so I had the luxury of uh, being able to talk and and um, get guidance from both Allison and Mary when Sue and I started up. Now that work out? <laughs> Say what? Right. We said yesterday, <laughs> friends don't let their friends make cheese. <laughs> I know, that's our, our thing. We tried to talk you out of it, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, you know, I think every, most people, most cheesemakers in the United States um, are very helpful to others that are starting. So, it's, it's more of a collaboration in a sense of bringing something good to the table rather than being competitive, with the exception of the cheese festival. <laughs> yes. That's right. It wasn't easy to get your cheeses out there back then, was it? Well, when I first went to the first cheese festival, I think there was three tables of, three plastic tables of cheese that came out all with their wrappers still on them. And um, I don't know how many there was last year and over a thousand. So it's, oh. it's, it's really changed. Is this the California festival or the ACS festival? The first ACS festival. Oh yeah. It was in the yeah. basement. I, my first ACS, Clark Wolf, it was in Boston and he was trying desperately to auction off the cheese and the cheese was uh, <laughs> not best in show quality. <laughs> yeah. I think there were about 12 of us standing in a horseshoe. And of course, none of us had any money, so we couldn't, no. we couldn't fit on yeah. <laughs> What? Yeah. Uh, hey, um, Allison and Mary, what years were the first 
American Cheese Society conference that you all went to? Uh, I think we went in 86. I want to say 86. I think I went a little before that, but even before ACS, Judy uh, Shadden and I used to go to um, the American Dairy Goat Association, and we had AGPA, <laughs> which was American Dairy Goat Products Association, and Pan was our um, our hero. <laughs> so, ah. yeah, it was pretty fun. Yeah, but it's it's really changed so much. There's Michael. Yeah, I'm just sitting in the background. I don't want to let you guys be out there, but uh, uh, what were some of the um, things that happened when you were trying to get your cheeses out there? I mean, they weren't exactly uh, common cheeses that were being produced at the time. Oh, no. <laughs> My <Yeah>. mom cried. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, of course, in Vermont, um, Vermonters ate only cheddar. And so to think you were going to offer a soft goat cheese to the market was just preposterous. Most people don't, wouldn't even try it. They won't, even, wouldn't, wouldn't taste it, wouldn't try it. They'd say, nope, don't eat that, don't want that. We would drop off, Bob would drop off six cheeses um, on a Monday and come back the next week and take three back and drop off six more. And, you know, it didn't take long to figure out that that was not going to be a winning formula. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. used to um, take cheese to the Greyhound bus station in Eureka and put it on the bus at the night bus to San Francisco. And then at that time, Columbus Distributing was my primary distributor in the Bay Area. And they would go down to the bus station, pick up this soggy box of cheese because it was all wrapped in saran wrap. We didn't have a cryovac machine. And they, <laughs> so they said, well, why don't you put holes in the boxes like the French do? So I got a hand drill and I drilled the holes. In. I mean, it was kind of the same. You're selling a dozen cheeses on a really good day. <laughs> Where I worked, we, um, in 1980, uh, I worked at Chez Panisse and um, upstairs in the cafe, we worked with a goat cheese and we, um, we coated it in breadcrumbs, just really similar to the way that it's done in France, um, you know, a lot in Provence. And um, people thought it was just so revolutionary. And yeah. the cheese that we would get would come on the Greyhound from uh, from Calistoga area. It was from Laura Chanel, and um, it was so it was so amazing to me how many people ordered that salad uh, when they all would say, "I've never had goat cheese. This is really great." Yeah. Yeah. I had the opposite experience, which was, oh, I've had goat cheese before, and they would just back up as far as they could. Um, no thanks. We did, a, we, did a farmer, yeah. we did a farmer's market um, in southern Vermont, and when you think of the number of cheese makers at farmer's markets today, you don't, you can't even buy a cheese from all these people, and yet there I was standing behind this little table, and people, you could see them thinking, I think that woman over there is selling cheese. Cheese. <laughs> How odd, like cheese. And then, and then, and it's goat cheese. Like, oh, the poor, poor thing. Poor <laughs> thing. <laughs> That's how my mom was. Oh, yeah. Honey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You poor little thing. Well, we didn't, when I first started, we did not have a milk pump. So, um, I would milk the goats and I had a strainer that I put over a 10 gallon can, right? And strained the milk and I put that 10 gallon can in a trash can full of ice water. And every time I would strain one goat's milk, I would swish the can, which was really effective. It cooled it very fast. But then I had to lift that can into my fridge and then put it in my car and drive it to the creamery. And then we hand pump, hand dumped it into the pastures. So I mean, we had no equipment. 
to at the beginning. None at all. Oh yeah. No. I mean, no, no. milk. Pump. I, M- milk can was a big purchase. Oh yeah. Milk can. Yeah. That, that was, was. Oh my God. When did, when did you all get your first um, professional vats? Oh. Cheese vats. Well, <laughs> I don't know if we ever did. <laughs> We had a 50 gallon vat pasteurizer that was here at the farm where I'm sitting right now is where we started our business and where I live in a little milk house. And so we converted that to pasteurize milk and make cheese. And I, your, your story about the, the milk can, Mary, reminds me of making creme fraiche. And I would go to the dairy and put my 50, my 10 gallon cans under the separator and bring home cream and pasteurize it. And I didn't have enough cold water to actually cool it. So I would add, I would cool it as much as I could, which was at about 72 degrees. I'd add my starter culture. Then I'd pour it out back into the can, back into the can where I brought the raw cream. Oh. Then I would put the can into a beverage cooler. I'd lift this sucker up and put it into the beverage cooler and let it cool overnight. And that's when it would ferment and it would get, you know, sort of start to get some texture. The next day I would take it out, pour it back into the vat, warm it up so I could package it. And I packaged it by pouring it into a little pitcher and I pour it into the little cups. But the bulk tank was kind of, you know how the bulk tank is sort of, um, it's not flat. Yeah. So I'd pour it in, and the cups would sort of migrate down. <laughs> no. I'd have to like, I'd have to catch them with the lid and then put the Lucy. Off. <laughs> yeah, Lucy or in that candy uh, scene where she's sticking it <laughs> down. <laughs> you have to go fast enough to catch them before they fall off. The, right, yeah, you it was drink a lot, a lot like... of creme fraiche to do that. <laughs> Yeah, I had a 50 gallon vat pasteurizer to begin with, too, and didn't come anywhere near filling it up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would drive all day around Vermont and I'd go to these little backyard 4 H herds and I'd pick up three, you know, 30 gallons here and 20 gallons there. And, and it was about a 200 mile loop and I'd get back at the end of the day and start making cheese at about five o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> ay, 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 yeah. How'd you ever figure out cost of goods? <laughs> well, what would that be? <laughs> <laughs> what, what are cost of goods? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know either. Your, your time doesn't count in cost of goods, I guess. Oh, no. absolutely. Sorry. We Sorry. were gonna make so much money. We were so yeah. excited. <laughs> Your, yeah. your, or your gas or your anything. Right, you know? right. That was so bad. <laughs> yeah, those, those first deliveries were something where you have a little six cheeses or something, like you said, to drop off. And the thing is, you're so proud of what you're doing and uh, so mission driven that I thought it made it all worthwhile to me. I mean, there were times I would be cussing, of course, but um, for the most part, it, it made us proud. Yeah. I didn't cuss, but I cried a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was the same thing, you know, working uh, 18 hours was just what you did because yeah. you know, it was required. And I don't know if I was really not smart at all or what, but it didn't occur to me to do something else. I just loved it so much. Yeah. No, it... Well, other than your fresh cheeses, um, like what was the first aged cheese you made? Um, whoops, now Uh-oh. Allison. Where'd Allison go? She's over at Michael's, I think. <laughs> I didn't like the question. I know. Well, for me, the first eight, first not fresh cheese, we made uh, kind of a Colby, um, uh-huh. a washed curd cheese that um, we had a hundred gallon vat. And it was really, it was okay, but it's not the highest and best use of goat milk. Yeah. Um, 
and then we did i did a really nice uh blue cheese for a while uh -huh. and then tried to do it again a few years later but once you've got white mold all over the place neither's going to be happy with a new yeah neighbor. they're just fussy did you start right off with the cheeses you have now oh gosh no we we just <laughs> Oh, no. we, and initially we weren't really planning on making other cheeses than fresh cheese um so we started with fromage blanc and creme fraiche and cottage cheese and quark and um we also made ice cream but it was it was just kind of survival mode to make the ice yeah. cream because we would sell all of those things at the farmer's market but um yeah, we didn't start making our f first aged cheese probably for a year and a half after we started. Oh. Well, that's pretty fast. I didn't start Humble Fog until four or five years later. And yeah. no, nobody liked that at first until um, I think Florence Fabricant wrote an article in the New York Times. I have no idea how she got a hold of it, but that changed my life when somebody real and fancy said this is good <laughs> like your cheese yeah, yeah yeah but mostly but that really did change things for me but so um mary when did you because i don't even know this like you had goats initially and then did you have goats throughout the whole your whole tenure at humboldt i mean at cypress grove no. So I got my first goats because I, we were doing the back to the land thing and Mallory, my oldest daughter, was about one. And so I wanted her to have goat milk. So you know the story. I caught the wild goat and the lady said, if you can catch it, you can have it. So I started with Hazel and Esmeralda, two wild goats. And then um, I got involved in showing goats. So I bought the first um, breeding stock from Jennifer Weiss's parents. So that's how long we've been. Wow. And so I did the whole showing goats thing and the cheese kind of came after that. So it was first the goats as a back to the land protein source mm -hmm. uh, for the kids. And so that was 19, the first goats were 1971. Yeah. And then I kept the goats until probably about four years after I started. So till the late 80s, I kept the goats. Hi, you're back. Yes, hi, Allison. For over a month. <laughs> We're Sorry. so tired. Anyway, and so then one woman bought the whole herd at once because it, you know, when you have animals, you get up in the morning, you milk the animals. I would get the girls off to school, make cheese, get their dinner, milk again. It, it was just, I couldn't do anything well. And, and that's just, nobody wants to have another mediocre thing, that's for sure. So yeah. that worked. And then we got the herd um, for Cypress Grove, I think, what was it, 10 years ago, give or take? Yeah, it must have been. I think Vermont, we did Ayersbrook about eight years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And so now that is really incredible because the production of those goats is um, about a gallon a day per doe, which is kind of unheard of in a large herd. Um, all humane certified and they're super healthy. And it's just that makes me really happy to see that. Because the farmers work so hard and to have a model that is possibly replicable is nice. Yeah, yeah. How, how's Ayersbrook doing? Oh my God, they are doing so well. Um, when, we, when we sold Vermont Creamery, um, Don and I, my husband Don, Bob's... Uh-oh. That Allison, is she's harder. trying to out on us, isn't she? But mm -hmm. um, we we kept the uh, we bought the, uh, the farm. <laughs> we bought the farm from uh, from Mount Creamery and thought, oh God, what have I done? And Miles, my son Miles, took it over, and um, he and his wife 
run it now and they're just doing great. I mean, they turned it around, they're making money. They got other enterprises, they're making goat salami, they're doing lots of genetics and it's, uh, yeah, they're doing it. Yeah. Wow. And how do you peg to get organic milk there? Is that always a challenge? Did you say peg? Yeah. You're trying, um, you've always used organic milk, right? Yeah, we've always, uh, we've always used organic, I believe so strongly in it, um, but we've always worked with the Strauss family creamery and they were one of our inspirations to go into the business anyway. So um, I think that the organics actually with milk, cow's milk is really, um, conventional milk is really having a problem in the United States now. Um, they're, they're dumping a lot and the price of, of conventional milk is really low, but, um, but uh, organic milk is, is actually doing fine. That's okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. So Peggy, why did you decide with uh, organic or is it just because you're friends with the farms? Um, well, I, I truly believe in organics and um, my, my prior work was mostly with organics in cooking and uh, really promoting working with different, different producers to, um, to move into organics because I just think it's a healthier way uh to live and um for the it, for the planet in general i think organics is really important just the certifications that you need to go through really require that you have that kind of mentality for the most part mm -hmm. we you know, had such a hard time getting organic feed up here because we're about six hours north of the bay area so we went with certified humane which was is another way thinking if the animals are well cared for and we do as much as we can to get organic feed or really well well tended feed but it it's it's really hard with goats it i know goats are i think it's much harder yeah. uh it's a much harder proposition yeah they're not grazers you know yeah. so um, getting a consistent diet for, for goats um, is really, really hard. And I think that um, early on, in the early years when we were trying to get this goat cheese industry going, you know, if you had, if you were, a goat will have maybe two or sometimes three kids. Um, and while we don't um, administer antibiotics rare you know rarely we certainly don't do it prophylactically we don't use it as a growth hormone yeah uh, or antibiotic rather um but um sometimes when you're trying to develop a herd and uh develop good genetics you really can't risk having your best animals you know take them out of the herd or have them die because you can't treat them so um, you know, yeah. I think that, and I think that the goat, the goat world, we've, we've been able to grow really good forages, um, you know, improve the soils on our farm without commercial fertilizers. Um, you know, we don't grow corn. Um, so I think it's a, they're much, they're a much more benign critter than, um, than dairy cows in general lower carbon footprint from parts. So, uh, yeah. Let me just uh, check with you guys on, you know, talking with Mateo and, you know, him winning and you guys winning on, on uh, American Cheese Society awards for cheeses that actually were not meant to be the cheese. It was a, not a, quite a mistake, but it was fixing something. And Peggy, you uh, experienced that as well, right? Yes, we did. Um, I'm sure everybody here has. Ours was ours was with Red Hawk, and um, it was because somebody put was trying to be more of an affinor than was really a good idea, and they put um, a cheese with cheese mites 
in the aging room of the tam, Mount Tam that we make. And um, so the cheese mites jumped onto the um, tam while it was really molding. And um, <laughs> so being very frugal as we all, as we all still are, I should say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sure. we, we wash the cheeses off and put them in a different bucket uh, so that it would have a little bit of a different climate and so that the mites, if there were still any on them, wouldn't jump onto the other cheeses. And it created more of a wash drying cheese than um, we'd anticipated. And it was a, a really good mistake for us. I'm sure everybody has a story like that. Yeah. I, when I was going to make uh, truffle tremor, I thought of it as a fresh cheese. But when I mixed the truffles in with the fresh cheese, it was just like a fight in your mouth. There's all that acidity and brightness of the fresh goat cheese and then that deep earthy truffle flavor and it just didn't work. So again, being too stingy or frugal is the nicer word. <laughs> I didn't want to throw it away. I packed it into little molds and we put it in the aging room. And then it was really lovely because the ripened earthy flavor of the cheese really worked with, with the truffle flavor. And yeah, um, I think, I love that cheese. I think that the balance of the acid and the earthiness of the truffles, um, yeah. I think that it accentuates the truffles so much more than happening to add truffle oil. Yeah, well, we never wanted to add truffle oil. It's just not, you know, not what you want to do. But um, I think when all of us started, there weren't recipes. You know, well, I didn't have recipes. I just, I read something in French and I only speak a tiny bit of Spanish. So really way over my head. I didn't really know what I was doing. I just kept playing around till it tasted okay to me. Yeah. And hope that worked. Yeah. Allison, you had to go to France. How did, so you <laughs> learned. Well, you were, I learned on a little farm and we were, um, you know, we had, um, we were making raw milk pieces. So we, they didn't use any starter cultures. Um, they added a little rennet, you know, with the uh, whey and, you know, mix it that way. and. Um, so when I started to make here in Vermont, of course I had to really change everything because we had to pasteurize the milk yeah. and, um, started using starter culture since I think I, I, I followed the, um, I'm sure you're going to remember this book, the, the nuns, oh, the no. nuns in, um, <laughs> yeah. And they were super helpful. And, you know, for years I managed to get, um, you know, people in France to help me in the sort of first, you know, 15 years. Um, I think they felt sorry for me. And um, I, I'd say somebody like Pascal Jacquin, who was making Seltzer Share, I'm sure he thought, well, this bambouche looks an awful like like awful lot like salsa share so i better give her some pointers so she doesn't totally screw up his market right so <laughs> if, if, if the bambouche is really bad nobody will buy salsa share because they look a lot alike so he yeah. was extremely helpful <laughs> um, but uh yeah so i i guess we all knew enough to be dangerous right <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to go too far down that path, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> really glad yeah. we were. <laughs> so, you know, when you all started adding to the cheeses, you know, uh, uh, Mary, you added lavender to that. You, you know, created some really fun names. Um, Peggy, you, you seasonal um, uh, ingredients on your cheese. And Allison, you know, you're using some of the uh, Vermont direction. So tell us more about why or how, you know, those things came about and why lavender? Why, you know, use the spring, fall, winter and all that? Maggie? Oh, um, well, 
what one of the things um, that everybody <clears throat> notices, and it, it's I think most apparent in goat's milk, but because um, it is seasonal, um, but we notice a change in the spring, definitely with the the way the milk tastes, and um, as it carries through the different seasons, the milk flavor really changes a little bit. And you know, it's not like a well, it, in the spring, it's very, very noticeable. And then uh, depending on what the animals are eating, the flavor of the milk changes. So we really wanted to accentuate uh, or, or in a way, um, well, accentuate the flavor changes, but also just a recognition that it does change. And uh, the idea was to really help people to think about that and think about farming in general and that it's not, it's not just like push a button and you get milk. Uh, <laughs> it's a real living thing. And so that's what we wanted to, to accentuate. Yeah. When I started, everybody's cheeses had a French name. And, you know, I tried at the very beginning, we made a two pound log, you know, like a boucheron. And, um, it, it just didn't make sense to me to be in California copying other people's cheeses or trying to even be similar. So we really tried hard to be really innovative and come up with flavors that were different, shapes that were different. And the styles that are different was easy because we really didn't know too much about what we were doing. So it's kind of making it up as we went along. but. A friend of ours, fennel pollen, and I just, it's the same way I cook. I got everything out of my cupboard and started tasting till I found something that worked with that fennel pollen. And the lavender, you know, if you've ever been to Provence, and I have it all over my yard now, mm. it's just, it's the perfect foil to that fennel, I think. So, you know, just trying to be creative and and that's for me a lot of the fun is coming up with ways to use it or make it or be, have it be different yeah i would say um that early on you know we were all making fresh goat cheese the um fresh ship and um just trying to figure out how to stay in business it was a good cheese because you didn't have to age it. You could get cash in the business. I mean, that was like the most important thing, you know, really yeah. just trying to stay in business, make something, sell it, try to get paid, try to stay in business the next week. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I, th then we started to um, put herbs around the cheese or peppercorns and stuff. And um, I kind of did that kicking and screaming because I really didn't, I was kind of a purist about flavored cheese. And yet um, the goat cheese market, I mean, today there are so many different flavors of Chev in the supermarket and they sell. I mean, Americans really seem to like cranberries and blueberries and all this stuff all over it. And I'm thinking, well, okay. I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't buy it, but that's fine, you know. Um, but I also think that what what was really important for all of us when we as we were sort of emer this market was emerging, we each made our fresh chev, but we all had to come up with some style of cheese that was unique and could be sold in every region of the country. So okay. that because we were doing the small format geotrichum cheese we could sell that in california and people wouldn't say but we already have a california goat cheese we already have a soft ripened cheese here it was something different so yeah. um it was really and you know when when you, we talk to cheesemakers you say you've got to look at the market and figure out what's missing and how you can leverage what you have, you've already established a regional market and a regional brand, but if you really want to expand your market, you've got to come up with something new. And I think people are struggling with that now. You know, yeah. there's, 
You know, I can remember talking to, um, you know, the gals at Point Reyes when they were first starting, thinking about what they wanted to make. And, you know, I said, geez, you know, there isn't really a lot of blue out there. <laughs> you know, think about that. Yeah. So, um, uh, it's hard to come up with new things now, I think. It is. I don't know what you guys feel about that, but. Well, there's so many, you know, there's over a thousand cheeses at every ACS and it's, and it's not just new for new sake. Um, people don't want to buy something just because you choose to make it. They want to buy it because they want it or there's a need for it. And, and it's really thinking of your customer and what are their needs? Why would they? That was the one question I answered on a business plan was why would somebody want to buy this? And it made me think pretty deeply about, <clears throat> it isn't about me or my goats, it's about your customer and what do they want and need and how can you make them happy? Yeah. Yeah. I, I also think that uh, sometimes there's uh, a tendency to try and have too many SKUs in your, um, <laughs> with your products and um i've what i've seen is it takes a while for things to really catch on when you when you send out a new cheese there'll be lots of nibbles at the beginning but you have to persevere with that if you really stand behind it because it takes a while for those cheeses to catch hold um outside of your immediate region and um Sometimes I think people don't give enough time for their cheese to really take a stronghold or they think they need to have too many right off the bat. And um, that can, that could, that can lead to not good cash flow. <laughs> yeah. Well, and not good cheese also. I think so often in America, we want what's new and exciting and that gets you in a market, but it doesn't really solve a purpose or you know um i one of the things i most remember at a fancy food show the woman next to me one year was reggiana parmesan all day long people are coming up to our booth what's new what's new and i said well we make the same cheese and it's still really good it's still <laughs> new. yeah we make one cheese for how many hundred years <laughs> yeah. and that stuck with me that it's nice to do something really well that you're really proud of that you know is good every time yeah yeah i think that we become um also you know we our distributor customers or our retail customers say so what's new right as you say and, and you want to say i just bought brought you something new last year let's try to sell this you know let's 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 sample it and get it out there and really and really it's a, it's up to the cheesemaker to um be firm and say no we're standing behind this we haven't we haven't fully um um realized uh the potential of the you know foundational cheeses of the company that are the right. things that are really going to build value long term and be the sort of mainstay highly predictable you know brand builder that you're trying to to establish um yeah. we have to resist that um you know request every quarter what's new what's new what's new yeah well i think now also with um in the market what's what i see happening is that um they're expecting more from the producers in the way of con contributions to making those sales sales so it's it's gotten so much more expensive yeah. to be able to put your cheese in a marketplace and if you consider um bringing on more new things that you really have to push in your marketing um it's a hard decision to be able to do that because you really have to think about how much how much you're going to contribute toward the promotion of that product when you have other cheeses out there that you're still standing behind firmly and you want them to do well yeah and and why <laughs> when there's you know 
thousands of cheeses, do we need another cheese? I mean, really, if we do, great, I'm all for it. But, or if somebody's got something really special coming down the road, but just for the sake of something new, I don't think, um, I don't think that's enough to warrant, you know, risking what you've already got and all the failures. <laughs> I mean, what, what percentage of, of new products really make it? Yeah. And at the same time, you have to be willing to say goodbye to things that are just not performing. You know, yeah. all those products that you made that you said, oh, that was really fun, but eh, not going to cut it. It's out of here. And then the customers go, oh, but that goat fontina, we loved that. It's like, yeah, sorry out <laughs> you know all, all of our <laughs> conference rooms are named after a cheese that died so right. we have marble mountain we have semper virens we have fog lights <laughs> oh my gosh yeah i yeah. mean and pam used to tell me the customer is talking and i was like but, but i love this cheese. you know i'm all <laughs> yeah all right. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you, you know, we have together done numerous pairings with uh, beverages and foods and all that. And, you know, all these years of all the times that you've taken your own product home and you've done things for friends and family, what are some of the things that you'd like to share that uh, you really love about being able to pair what you have with, you know, numerous things? Hmm. We, we, one of my favorite things since I love sweets <laughs> so much is to take a Humboldt fog and cut it in half um, along the ash line and split it and then put a little um, turbinado sugar and torch it and then serve that with fresh fruit. It is so yummy. It's kind of like um, salted caramel but not that sweet so you have the savory of the cheese you have the crunch and the um, sweetness of the sugar and then the fresh I love it with berries especially it's a it's a really dessert in a meal <laughs> it's one of my favorites that sounds good it's yeah. yummy and easy <laughs> how about you Allison Oh, um, well, one of the most fun, um, uh, I'd say, ways to promote um, Bijou is to cut it in half, as you described, Mary, and then um, toast it on a slice of a baguette with the rind up and then put it under the broiler and let it just sort of sizzle and um, eat it on a salad. And when we started to do that, we um, were taking them to um, restaurants and basically suggesting that this bijou salad could be more of a center of a plate item for lunch. And um, it's, it's something that, um, you know, we've done at um, in cooking classes and they're, it's easy to, very easy to do. And it always, um, people love it. It's, yeah. it's a great way to show that type of cheese. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see one of, one thing that I really like, and it's not something any of us came up with, but there was, um, a fella from, um, Italy that came into our store in Point Reyes and uh, was looking at the fromage blanc and he said, one of my favorite desserts is taking uh, fromage blanc and mixing it with a little bit of creme fraiche yeah. to um, add some, some depth to the fromage blanc. But then taking some finely ground espresso and then shave some chocolate mm -hmm. and mix that all together and, and just serve it on uh, like biscotti or a shortcake or something like that. And it's a, a really simple dessert and really good with like sauterne. Yeah. yeah. That sounds <laughs> We ate that every single day on the farm in France. We had fromage blanc with creme fraiche and sugar for every day, yeah. every day, yeah. And so. it's super good. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really good. 
And I, we used to do one like that with just fold in some whipping cream and um, some kind of liqueur, depending on what fruit you were gonna serve it with, um, that would match the fruit. And you can freeze the little, I used to do it in little heart-shaped molds. And then when I had company, there was always something that I didn't have to think about. So that yeah, sounds yummy. All or right. anything like creme mm -hmm. fraiche with almost any. Your go to beverages then? Champagne, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best <laughs> campaign yeah i think it's it, the bubbles i mean i actually prefer beer with with cheese than than wine or champagne i mean champagne's first and then i would go to beer because i like getting that effervescence to yeah. clear the palate i like um i like beer with cheese um with harder cheeses and i like um I like Pinot Noir with um, some some dense uh, creamy cheeses because I think that the astringency of the Pinot really like accentuates the flavors and uh, makes it more of a dessert. And mm -hmm. I love some green cheese um, with different cheeses, like a real mild green cheese actually works really well um with some goats goats cheeses and and i've found sorry to go on but i also really like sake with um some harder cheeses mm. 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 yeah i would say um you know champagne or sauvignon blanc or something that's got a lot of minerality goes so great with the goat yeah. cheeses it just it's very simple and yeah. 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 Sauvignon Blanc is a yeah. really go to all around that works well with, I think, every every cheese. Mm. Always in the wine cooler. Yep. For sure. Yeah. I, I've been pairing up uh, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale with uh, goat cheese for 15 years. Wow. And it, even today, uh, you know, I, I had a conversation about doing some pairings. Uh, with a magazine and we were talking about well okay if you're gonna pair up something with goat cheese what's the first thing you're gonna grab and then a uh, uh, pale ale uh, through yep. there but I really that yep so so you know, you know, right so now, michael after 15 years do you think you might like it <laughs> <laughs> you know well you know it's a uh, beer and <laughs> All right. Well, so, you know, one thing I want to say though is I've been on some incredible pairing panels with yeah. uh, Michael and Me especially too. with Allison. Oh, uh, <laughs> I have a reputation. <laughs> who, who has come up with some uh, quite really? remarkable quotes, but um, I can't think of them right now. But um, Brown, it was. <laughs> Well, you know, my first time that I did a pairing with you guys, uh, well, it started with Allison and uh, Mareke was there and she was talking about uh, one of her flavored cheeses that tastes a little lot like maple. And uh, I thought Allison was going to come unglued. <laughs> oh, that's just a that little Vermont sort of snobbery about maple, I guess. Huh? So. With us being, uh, you know, more or less homebound and, and working on our recipes, I don't know about you, but two months into this, uh, I have a, a set of recipes that I've been doing for a long time. So my objective lately is to change out my cheeses with the same type of recipe. So think about this. What, what do you think about, you know, using your some of your cheeses, but using them, uh, same cheese, but different recipes, so we can kind of say, okay, well, we got this great cheese and we can use it in, what would you do? I'm hmm. trying to figure out the question. Yeah, me too. <laughs> the question is, okay, you, have, you, have, you have one cheese, but you can use different recipes and different things that you can do with it. Uh, not just, oh. uh, uh, you know, changing the cheese on a recipe would be, you know, uh, helpful. Uh, because we do the recipe, but you change the cheese and you get a different flavor characteristic. So, yeah, that's just how we always cook. You look in the fridge and see what you 
I agree with Mary, that is how we cook, but um, I think it's just being able to um, easily figure out what kind of, how, how um, similar is the cheese that you want to use to something that you've used before, just like water content and, or moisture content and um, elasticity or meltability. Or, yeah. And then yeah. what else do you have in your fridge that you need to balance out? So, I mean, if, you know, if you're doing pizza with capers, you know, what, you know, you don't want something real salty to go along with that. Yeah. But, yeah. What, it's, what, you put on your yeah. blindfold, Michael, and you just start feeling around in there and you say, okay, this feels soft and this feels, oh, it feels like it has extra mold on it. And this one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And you can always just mix and match with grilled cheese to see how things work, like three yeah. combination cheeses. And um, it's a good way to use up little bits. And with my granddaughter living with me, I can't tell you how much mac and cheese we are going to yes. <laughs> It is like grilled cheese sandwiches and mac and cheese, at least yeah. once. It's the thing. That's good. Peggy, yeah. it's funny that uh, I did uh, an interview with Pat Ford uh, last week, and he talked about you telling him about using multiple cheeses in a recipe. So uh, give an example of uh, what you guys would throw in together. Um, what, if I were, if, when I make a grilled cheese, I like to have uh, add some fromage blanc and and grate like a hard cheese, uh, like a little bit of Parmesan or Asiago, um, and then add something along the lines of uh, I hate to say this, but like wagon wheel. That's something that's very um, melty, meltable. Uh, yeah. But if you make those, if you mix those all together and you grate them, sort of the um, the cheese so that it will really integrate before you put it in the uh, pan, it works really well. We we always have a bag of mixed grated cheese. Yeah. You know, we use Midnight Moon Lamb Chopper and then one or two other things. Those are always in my fridge. And then whatever else we have yeah. and a little fresh goat cheese. It's, yeah. Yeah, suspense, it, really it, it suspends it, so it, it works really well. And you get a, a complexity of flavor that you don't get with just one, so I think it really works. I, we always do that. Yeah. All How right. about you? I'm going to take you guys back a little bit but uh, to uh, uh, an ACS conference and uh, kind of talk about, uh, you know, you're kind of – your interactions with each other. You know, you have had all this time together and uh, I know you guys are friends and you've helped each other over the years, but uh, you know, there's, there's gotta be some, uh, you know, interesting incidences that you would like to share with us. <laughs> no, we're not sharing. <laughs> Well, one thing that I think about is, remember when we were uh, forming the California Artists and Cheese Guild way back when, and there's all these cheesemakers just sitting down on a rug in some carpet in one of the big rooms, and at the end of it, it was like, okay, we got it. It was yeah. that, that was really uh, rewarding, I thought. Yeah. I just always enjoy... Um going to the conference, the American Cheese Society conference, to see everybody. And um, generally speaking, we get to have dinners together or lunches um, and just talk sincerely about what's going on, um, get to try new things. And I don't, it, it's such a camaraderie. I, I just feel um, really happy to be part of it. Yeah, I, I would say um, there really isn't um, there isn't anybody else in my universe who 
really understands through or going through, whether it's having a problem with the milk and the cheese isn't working or, you know, you don't have, there were times when like you'd call them and say, Hey, have you ever had this? And they're like, I'm ah, sort of, but you know, once in a while, but I don't really know what's going on. And, you know, we'd sort of try to puzzle through things and, and then trying to figure out how are we going to get these farmers to, um, milk goats for us where are we going to get this milk how you know like all of those sort of big bigger sort of strategic questions that we they were always always bearing down and then it was transitioning the ownership of the company you know and that's just such a big huge decision and super scary and you know, you got to be able to talk to your peers who are thinking the same things about them in a way that is highly confidential, really, and, um, um, you know, very honest. And um, you, to this day, you know, like, um, you sort of want to check in and say, how you feeling? Like, well, Mary, <laughs> like, 10 years out, right? Or eight years, I'm three years out. Peggy, you're just, you're just, Baby, you know, starting to be yeah. retired, and um, you know, you go through a lot of different um things, but um, I'm just so grateful for a community of people that really know what I'm thinking, yeah. And don't you think it's kind of unusual to have a field where people are as I mean, like you said, I could call either of you and ask a really confidential question and know you're not going to go try to make me look bad in the marketplace. Oh, Mary doesn't know what in the world she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> or she's having this problem. You, uh, there's not that. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's so, so lovely. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really rare. And I don't know why that is, maybe just because we all came at it with good intention. I don't know. We didn't start off just making a lot of money <laughs> as our primary goal, and we've been good at that. <laughs> well, I guess my, my feeling about that is that um, when we all started, there was a real authenticity about yeah. what we were doing because we didn't have a marketing plan we didn't go through a branding mm -hmm. exercise we didn't have any of the sort of basic fundamentals of business that you know you're supposed to go through we were undercapitalized we didn't know anything about cash flow we didn't know how to about hr and employees and a balance sheet and all these things and so just, you you figure it out as you go and so there isn't any grand plan about this is how i'm going to communicate my marketing message and my brand <laughs> plans for this and this you know it just sort of evolved and you know i think i remember talking to a pr firm you know a bunch of years into it and they asked me uh so like have you ever told your story and i said well why what do you mean my story like why would i do that like everybody has to have a job right like what what's the big deal and they're like are you kidding me i'm telling your story like what does that have to do with making this cheese and trying to get it into somebody else's mouth they don't care who i am you know so i think there's something you know we all sort of had that we weren't all sort of trying to elbow and to sort of say well my message is more you know, more pure or um, politically correct or sustainable or whatever your buzzword is um, yeah. than the other. So just is. Yeah. You know. I think it's still that way pretty much. I see a lot of camaraderie through, through all these years and that's really, really lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How's that beer, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, it's it's really nice. Uh, you know, I can't think of the last time that we all sat down drinking together. Uh, Peggy, I can. Uh, you know, we managed to make it to Ernie's uh, Tin Bar and, and Lagunitas last time I was in. So that worked out really well. And Allison is up in Vermont. And Mary, I apologize that I've never been out to visit you, but I will correct that. 
hopefully Good. when we're able to travel again. Good. So I want to thank you girls, the ladies, lovely <laughs> to sort of, for you know taking the time and, and coming out and playing. It's it's always such a pleasure uh, being with you, and uh, you know I I miss you so much. I wish that we could do more. I hope that sometime next year we could do this live somewhere where we are able to uh, you know really have uh, a, a nice crowd and be able to uh, celebrate our, uh, our our friendship. So thank yeah. you, Mike. Thanks, and Mike. Nice everybody. Bye, guys. Bye for having it. it's been great really fun to get together women <laughs> there's my little oh, one hey. <laughs> say hi to peggy yeah all right oh there's a bunch of questions on here but uh i i think that uh i'm gonna save them up and uh we'll we'll do this again and uh, you you have some really fun questions on here and uh either that or i'll send them out to you so again Love you, and uh, please take care of yourselves, and uh, I'll see you soon. All right. Hey, bye. Bye. Buddy. Okay, bye. bye. Uh, I have uh, another series coming up. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, Carrie coming up from Ellsworth. There's a, an entire two weeks left of the American Cheese Month. So hopefully you'll join me on one of those as well. I'm looking forward to having you guys uh, uh, see these, learn a little bit more, and tomorrow we're going to taste some cheese just like we have been all week. So take care. Thank you so much, and uh, go out and buy some great American artists.